Okay. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for the, today's Find the Wide Brown Bag. We're so excited to see so many people from across the agency uh, joining us for today's discussion on where and how we build using land use and building codes to increase resilience. Today's webinar is a joint effort between building sciences and the mitigation planning team. Planning starts at a high level, often with intermunicipal plans that span several communities or an entire region. And then they drill down to neighborhood level and building level where permits are given for how we build our buildings. These two mechanisms, land use planning and building codes are strong tools to increase community resilience and help communities develop in smart and disaster resistant ways. Um, we are so, so pleased to have Mr. David Marstead joining us this morning for opening remarks. Uh, David Marstead is, a, is highly regarded for his transformative leadership in communicating disaster risk, closing the insurance gap, and incentivizing mitigation actions against varied natural hazards with the primary goal of reducing disaster suffering for all communities. A veteran emergency manager, Mr. Marstead currently serves as the Deputy Associate Administrator of FEMA's Insurance and Mitigation Administration and the Senior Executive in Charge of the NFIP, the world's largest single peril insurance operation, providing over $1.3 trillion in flood coverage to over 5 million U.S. policyholders. David's expertise in emergency management and strategic risk communication stems from his substantial leadership roles in the private sector and local and state government as a former Nebraska mayor, senator, and lieutenant governor. Mr. Marsed skillfully, skillfully navigated his team through the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, historic 2020 hurricane season, and hundreds of high profile disaster operations in his current role and while in past leadership positions within the Insurance and Mitigation Administration, and as the former Region um, 8 Administrator. Um, Welcome, Mr. Marsted. Thank you for joining us. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, good morning, and uh, certainly thank you to the Planning and Building Sciences Division for inviting me uh, today, and, and thank you, Chrissy, for um, that uh, warm introduction. It's uh, always good to be with colleagues from across FIMA and resilience in the, in the virtual space. But friends, uh, I'm looking forward to the day where we can once again uh, meet face to face in our respective offices to learn about uh, how each of us is advancing our mission. Until then, uh, I'm grateful for webinars like this uh, that help uh, keep us connected and uh, provide insight into what other parts of FIMA are doing to increase resilience and reduce disaster suffering. When we work uh, cohesively and speak with one voice, um, I'm convinced that we will continue to move that needle forward. Uh, today's discussion uh, on land use planning and building codes is an extension of our efforts and will uh, shed more insight into the mitigation tools critical to building resilience. Over a year ago, we launched the uh, Building Codes Work Group which was charged with establishing agency-wide goals and strategies for the advancement and application of building codes and standards. The Building Codes Workgroup has an important mission to coordinate and prioritize uh, FEMA's activities to advance the education and influence the adoption of disaster resistant building codes uh, and standards for all agency programs and for communities nationwide. However, building codes are just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, the, the measure of a community's resilience is also uh, determined by plans, policies, and regulations that, are, that uh, govern both where buildings uh, and infrastructure are located and, and how they're built. Uh, the where is guided by uh, land use planning and development codes and ordinances, uh, and the how is determined by building codes. Uh, this, is not, this is not new for FIMA. The intersection of land use planning and building codes are reflected in FIMA's strategic objectives, 
objectives A1 uh, to integrate disaster risk and mitigation into community planning processes, and A3 to increase the adoption and enforcement of building codes, uh, both support outcome A uh, to catalyze uh, community partnerships to promote sustained and equitable investments in risk reduction. The, the planning processes that determine where we build also have uh, equity and climate change considerations. Uh, historically, inequitable planning has resulted in discriminatory practices that put uh, financial and other services out of reach for people based on their race or ethnicity. Uh, and planning processes that don't consider future risks lead to uh, communities and structures that are uh, more susceptible to disasters that are uh, becoming more frequent and more intense. If strongly built buildings are in hazard prone locations, then the, the buildings, the occupants and contents are still at risk for hazardous events. Too often decisions on uh, where and how uh, are handled by different departments at the state, local, tribal, and territorial level, uh, where um, our reach may be, may be limited. The purpose of uh, today's webinar is to discuss how uh, FIMA programs can take a coordinated approach to land use, planning, and building codes to achieve shared objectives that intersect across planning and codes. Mitigation planning is the established process that presents a unique opportunity to influence and guide community growth and development decisions toward resilience. Uh, FIMA programs like Risk Map, uh, BRIC, um, and mitigation planning, just to uh, name a couple, connect uh, the planning and building sciences aspects of our programs and uh, provide mechanisms to help Community, communities uh, secure assistance, both uh, financial and non-financial. I hope that today's webinar will help us frame the story of the where and how and lead to more exploration into how we connect uh, the puzzle pieces. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining today. Um, back to you, Christy. All right, thank you so much. Um, we have three great speakers today. Um, Perry, if you can switch to my slides, thank you. All right, first we have Anne Kuchenmeister. Anne is a community planner and land use uh, subject matter expert uh, on the Resilience Action Partners team. Anne pairs innovative solutions, sound data, and best practices to support communities as they strive to become safer by mitigating hazards and navigating the challenges of stronger regulation. Shuba Shravastava works in the National Mitigation Planning Program, currently leading training and technical assistance initiatives. Prior to joining FEMA, Shuba worked in the private sector conducting mitigation, recovery, and resilience planning efforts for state and local governments and supporting FEMA under various contracts since 2002. And finally, we are grateful that Amanda Slyas is willing to wake up early and join us this morning. Amanda is the Earthquake, Tsunami, and Volcano Program Manager for FEMA Region 10. Her perspectives on disaster safety through strong building codes and best practices offer a fresh take on shared goals to create disaster resilient communities. Next slide. So before we start uh, diving into our content, I wanna to put today's webinar in context. This is a context that is very likely familiar to all of you, whether you realize it or not. The concept of both where and how we build um, and providing those considerations for reducing risk is not new. For example, uh, when we develop the floodplain maps, there are A zones, AE zones, X zones to show different levels of, um, you know, where different regulations apply. These levels help you connect where you can build along with how you can build safely. So the zone is the where, but that building code or that um, floodplain management ordinance helps with the how of how you build safely. 
the location of hazards and of zoning has an impact on entire communities since damages in one area can trickle out and rebound to other areas. The pictures on the right show erosion undermining coastal homes in Pacifica, California in 2016, and homes uh, built along the edge of the coast in Santa Barbara, California on the bottom. These buildings may be built to code, but are they safe given where they're located? So we wanted to start and hammer home that these two pieces of the puzzle really do fit together to form a complete picture of risk reduction. I'll now turn it over to Anne, who's gonna talk about um, details and specifics of land use codes. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Chrissy, and good morning, everyone. Wait just a minute for the next slide, please. Great, so I'm gonna be speaking to the land use context. Um, next slide. So I think Christy did a really nice job of teeing this up, um, why we're talking about land use planning. So land use planning is our key tool to allow us to direct where development does or does not go. And it can really incorporate risk data to make those decisions. So land use planners have a big opportunity to keep um, structures and people and investment out of harm's way. And the three images you see here, we have examples of development that are either encroaching upon or already in harm's way, looking at the wildland urban interface, low-lying flood areas, and then also areas that are encroaching upon um, open agricultural lands or maybe drought-prone areas where you need water supply for homes. So thinking about our natural constructs of where we are developing, how we're designing those communities, and um, what they look like is really critical. Um, next slide, please. So first, just some basics of where we are within land use planning and what I'm talking about, what gives us the authority to do this, how much authority do we have or don't we have in these decisions. Um, jurisdictions have the legal right to control what is built and where through zoning maps and zoning regulations. Um, they can put specific controls in place to protect the life and safety and economy of our communities. And those are the, the really foundational tenets of land use planning is that we are focused on life, safety, and economic um, stability of our communities that we're in. And there's a lot of overlap there with what we see coming out of emergency management offices um, and also uh, floodplain regulations. So a lot of synergy around these topics. Um, the, the first piece of land use planning is how we subdivide land. So when we have raw land that's not developed, how do we take that and piece it out into smaller pieces? How do we put our infrastructure in the ground? What do our roads look like? Those initial decisions have major impacts on what a community looks like and how it has the capacity and ability to respond to disasters or stay out of harm's way in the event of disaster. So looking at a suburban layout, we have curvilinear streets. We have a lot of dead ends. It's an intentional design um, to give people a private and quiet street. But in the event of a disaster, what does that mean for evacuation routes? What does that mean for how we're using land and retaining open space and allowing for um, natural floodplains? So considerations like that are baked into how we make that initial decision of first using land. I know a lot of those decisions have been made in our communities and we have to think a little more retroactively, but um, it's, our, it's our biggest and first opportunity to really affect how well we work with nature. Next slide, please. So um, we are all unique snowflakes across the states. Um, land use planning is, is something that is enacted at the state level through enabling legislation and each state has slightly different terms, regulations, um, and guidance um, that are that's allowed. So one foundational element of this is thinking about the comprehensive plan, the general plan, or the master plan that a community puts together. This is usually the predecessor to zoning, so you have to have this in place in order to zone and regulate land. And note that I said usually, um, back to that special snowflake scenario, it's different in each state what is required to be in place or not in order to have those controls on land. The terms master plan, general plan, and comprehensive plan can be used somewhat interchangeably and generally mean the same thing. It depends on what state you're in as to what term is used. And the term usually comes out of the enabling legislation. What's in, what is in that statute 
is then carried over into what the plan is called for that direct connection, but again, varies by state. So just an important piece to know where this is coming from, where to look for those foundational elements that are then going to translate into how we make decisions about land. So today I'm going to be talking about land use tools, and I just want to define what I mean a little bit more by tools in this case. Um, tools are what I'm talking about as far as how we implement land use decisions and regulations. So the comprehensive plan or the general plan that I talked about before, that is our first element usually. So that's going to talk about what's a community's vision, um, what are the guiding ideas for then how we bake that into future land use maps, thinking about what this area built out should look like. Then zoning is really one of the, uh, the critical pieces that a land use planner has as far as regulation. It's kind of the, the feather in a planner's cap to really make sure that um, we're directing planning how, and land use how we want it. Regulations, incentives, policies, and programs are also other tools that communities can use to direct planning that we'll talk about. Um, zoning has a few different forms. I included one example here from um, Nampa in Idaho, who's recently updated their zoning. This is a use-based zone code. So that means that they're directing what uses can go where. There's also other forms of zoning. You can um, do zoning by forms. The building can look like this, and we would allow many different uses in it. Um, you can also zone by performance. In order to build on this site, you must meet, meet this criteria for how the development would perform, maybe on an environmental basis, maybe on a hazard basis, maybe on an economic basis. Um, the zoning map there, in this case, again, is dictating use. Generally, the colors are fairly standardized with yellow looking at residential, red looking at commercial, orange could be a mix, and then industrial um, and institutional are also looking at some of those other purples and blues, um, but generally standardized. All right, so I appreciate that this was touched on in the introduction as well, um, that you know, for land use planning, even though this building has clearly been elevated to try and mitigate against the risk of flooding, what will happen in the event of the flood is that we now have an elevated island that is disconnected potentially from our surrounding network of roads. Will utilities still be functioning to this site? Um, and then will, will this um, elevated structure be able to receive services in the event of um, hazard and disaster? So thinking not only about what that building code is that elevated this building, but was it appropriate to put this structure here? Could It looks to me like there's a lot of undeveloped space around the structure. Could there have been a better site that we could have directed this development towards in order to keep this from becoming an island that needs helicopter evacuation, for example? So thinking about those two things in tandem is really critical. And then the other piece that I was really excited to hear about in the introduction as well is that you know, zoning, land use regulation is something that really in the United States was picked up late 1800s to early 1900s. And it was a time in our country when inequity and inequality was really baked into our structures. Um, we still have that legacy in a lot of places, but much more blatant at the onset. And so when zoning and, and these regulations were initially developed, we also happened to be in a time when racism, inequities, were, were part of um, our system. So one term that I think people often hear is redlining. This was um, a, a system where we financially excluded resources from segments of our population. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the Hulk maps uh, is what directed the redlining decision. So these were maps that looked at different areas of a community and rated them on the investment um, capability. So I'm gonna read this example, which talks about the components of how you might rate an area of a Hulk map for whether or not it was worthy of investment. So this area located outside of East uh, St. Louis city limits lies level within sandy soil and it's about 60% improved. So it's talking about the geography of the area, um, can you build on the sandy soil? How much is already there? Schools and churches are conveniently located, but transportation to downtown East St. Louis um, is inconvenient. So again, how well is this connected to the network? What type of services are in place? These are pretty logical things to consider for um, 
you know, when you're thinking about an investment. Structures are a mixed type of many shacks and maintenance is generally poor. Population is now predominantly Negro and this element is gradually taking up the entire area. Because of rather unstable income types of population mixture and cheapness of structures and other undesirable features, area is given a fourth grade rating. Fourth grade rating is another way of saying red rating or lowest or hazardous, they use those terms. And it was based not only on soils and services, but also on the community there. So the outcome of this was to systematically take investment out of this area and not allow any government financial support for investing in properties um, through this program to be invested here, which increased the inequities of communities who were able to purchase here due to lower market rates, then seeing systematic disinvestment in their communities. Next slide. So this is the same community from which I just read that, um, that statement. Um, they have a severe problem with um, underinvestment in their stormwater infrastructure, which causes frequent repetitive flooding in the community. Um, it is a redlined community. Um, redlining went on for decades. Um, many of these community members have lived there for generations. So this is how you start to see that pattern of low income communities that often intersect with high hazard areas and areas of disinvestment. There were these structural inequities that early zoning practices um, exacerbated to put people into the scenario. Um, so it's important for us as planners to remember this, to remember the early inequities that were created out of these artificial constructs that we made. And when we go to do future planning, think about what are the intended and unintended consequences of these decisions? What do we not want to see in hindsight come out of our current day decisions and what can we learn from the past? Next slide. Um, another really blatant example is exclusionary zoning. So this was something that, again, happened in the early 1900s. Baltimore is here as an example, but really this is prevalent across the nation. Um, and it was a systematic way to segregate our communities using land use regulation and enabling legislation. These were later struck down by the courts, but they were in place for quite a while and in some, place, some places decades. And they really kept people, again, in these areas that were redlined. So first, a redline community's opportunity to have financial support is taken away systematically. But then later, and at the same time, people are told they cannot live anywhere else except for that community that is also being disinvested in. So the example here is that, um, again, a direct quote from the mayor at the time, in his zoning ordinance, Blacks should be quarantined in isolated slums in order to reduce the incidence of civil disturbance, prevent the spread of communicable disease into nearby white neighborhoods, and protect property values among the white majority. This was the governing law for how um, people could live in only a certain area. So again, you just see these systematic decisions that are creating inequities that are lingering today. And then the last example is from my own community. I live in Denver, Colorado, and you can go to the next slide, please. And we, you know, you can still see the um, early decisions made on the ground. And in our community, people have been trying to raise awareness of how these systematic decisions still play out in our everyday lives. Um, one of them is through an art project and a community project that came together to highlight how the race line, as we call it in Denver, so this was the line similar to that prior exclusionary zoning where white communities on one side, black and brown communities on the other, and this was the dividing race line for our land use zoning. They did an alley project to highlight that division so that people can still see how those long standing uh, decisions of inequity, of redlining, of zoning exclusion are still visible in our communities and how this line, while no longer part of our zoning code, is still something that is guiding choices around where people live and where community investment is and why one street is tree-lined and the other one has undersourced um, stormwater. So just still something that we see in our communities is important for us to be aware of um, and consider as we move forward. All right, so I now want to just connect some of the tools that we have on the table to talk about mitigation. Um, and I'll give a variety. This isn't all encompassing, 
Um, these are examples, there's many more. So as I'm speaking to these, I would love to hear in the chat box and I'll ping you again for this towards the end, other examples people have found effective or other questions people have about these tools um, that should be considered as we're thinking about them. So our first one's the overlay district. Um, at the beginning of this, I showed you the map of the zone districts, the zoning map with yellow and red, and which indicates our base zoning. So um, an overlay district, you could think of as sitting right on top of that. Um, it's an area that's specific to some sort of standard or data that it is then addressing on top of our base zoning. So it sits right on top. So it's a big opportunity when we have strong hazard mitigation plans, when we have strong data dictating where our hazard risks are, that we can take that data, we can make it a zone specific for those hazard areas, and then we can bake in um, strategies to address and mitigate the hazard. So some of those can certainly be building codes, um, which Amanda is gonna speak to more specifically. And some of them can be site design or setbacks or um, you know, directing investments away from hazard areas. Things like stream buffers, um, choosing appropriate building materials in the wildland urban interface, and then special permitting procedures or specific site review, thinking about um, slopes on a site or um, vegetation landslide risk. So there's a lot of flexibility in this tool to address the needs of a hazard. One example that is out of the Barber uh, Valley area looks at an overlay um, that retains space around um, their river. So this is a concept plan. This development has now been built out and exists, um, but you can see that the structures are set far back from the waterway and there's also public space near the waterway dedicated. So we're getting the benefit of both um, a large natural floodplain, water retention, detention in those open water areas, but also a community resource, um, a recreation benefit, retaining access to a natural um, space that is, a, that is something that the community can enjoy. So it's really trying to tick a lot of boxes here in this design um, within this overlay district. And the reason that the development looks like it does is not because the developer was super conscious of the requirements of the natural floodplain, but they had to work within the guidance of the overlay district that runs along the river, which says and dictates that you must have your structures set back from the river, that you must allow for access, that you must um, retain natural floodplains. Next one. Um, so at the beginning of this, I talked about subdivision and development. That initial, we have raw land and we're gonna break it up into pieces. That's a key opportunity. Um, it's, it's really a, a critical moment to think about what should be happening in our communities and what should it look like in order for us to have the character of the community we want, the values reflected, and also to keep people moving into our communities safe. It's never an easier time to keep people safe than at the initial decision-making point. Um, so these regulations can talk about the suitability for land division. Um, you know, if you have 100 acres, where should those divisions lie? What size should they be? Are there areas that really should never be developed? Um, they can have subdivision improvement agreements, so baking in um, contracts with developers, with the private entities, for how they're going to do that to make sure that they reflect, again, the needs of the site. Standards for natural hazard mitigation can certainly be part of that. And then um, cross-referencing to zoning and site development um, as well. Next slide. One example of this um, in Valley County, um, again in Idaho, is the Wildland Urban Interface Plan, where each site has specific um, guidance. And you can go to the next slide, I think I have the map, um, about the risk of wildfire as they're subdivided. So you can see some roads are coming in, utilities are coming in, and then the little red and yellow dots are indicating level of risk. And that could be based on slope fuels on the site, nearby fuels, separation from fuels, various components. And then based on that risk rating, the developer or homeowner or property owner must then um, submit a plan that responds to criteria to mitigate the known risk. So um, a pretty critical moment for both communicating to people the risks that they're about to take on, but also helping them plan to mitigate that. 
Um, density bonuses are another critical opportunity that offer an incentive. So it can be a pretty hard sell to tell someone that you own this beautiful piece of riverfront and you can't use it the way you want to. That's not an easy, easy thing to sell to people. So thinking about how we can work within what people have, work within um, what's available to developers to come up with a way to both allow for people to realize the value of their land, but also keep them out of harm's way. So density bonuses is a pretty cool incentive to do that where you can say, all right, you own this amount of land or you have this particular parcel. Um, how can you ensure that the way that we put the homes or the development on these parcels or parcel is going to keep people safe? Um, and going into the next slide. So in the, the um, upper image, I, as a land use planner, see some issues looking at a new development here that have been, they've tried to address in the lower image. If anything strikes anyone's fancy, put it in the chat box. But they've used in this case, a density bonus to try and mitigate um, some issues that could arise from that initial design in the community. Good, so um, Robin said one entrance to the neighborhood. So this is definitely a critical problem in that initial design addressed in the lower run where we have three entrances. So in the event that there's an emergency, we need to evacuate. If that is or there's fire blocking it, the entire community is now isolated from um, safety and resources. So that, that definitely addresses that. Some One other key difference I see here in the top one is that um, we don't have any open water or systems for retention detention through the site. We also don't have good accessibility with trails. So that's a, just a community benefit for natural resources. I don't see any designated um, communal open spaces. So that, that bottom one is trying to address a lot of those things. The other key thing to note is that the parcel sizes are much smaller in the, in the bottom one and they actually account for five more units. So that's where the density bonus comes in. We would like to see you mitigate X, Y, and Z. And in return, we're gonna allow you to use smaller parcel sizes to build more units and realize a greater investment, or I'm sorry, return on investment. Next one. So I pinged you guys all at the beginning of this um, for other tools. This is not a comprehensive list. If things are on your mind, I'd love to hear them in the chat box or during discussion at the end of the presentation. Um, but there's definitely more strategies and tools available to us. And um, with the brain power on this call, if other people have heard of things or seen things done well, um, or have other issues that they haven't seen addressed, I think that would be a great uh, topic for our discussion. Um, next. Great, so we talked about the comprehensive plan at the beginning of this, which can also be called general or master plan as that initial guidance and visioning for the community. Um, it really outlines the goals. It's gonna guide zoning and development. Um, it's gonna indicate policy changes, regulatory updates. And usually the people leading that strategy are going to be land use planners, such as myself. And then on the other side of the house, we have planning out the enabling legislation, we're really looking at the health and safety of the community as that foundational um, piece that gives us the right to regulate land. Hazard mitigation plans are also looking at health, safety, economic vitality of a community. So some overlap there. And they're, they're really calling amazing data on hazards, risk, vulnerability, and putting together actions and strategies to then mitigate that. Um, they're relying on solid data with firms. They're looking at um, you know, FEMA criteria. They're updated every five years with an annual review and they're led by emergency managers. So key point in who's leading these is very different people, um, very different skill sets, and also usually different departments in larger communities. Um, I will note that the comprehensive plan also doesn't have any uh, regulated timeline. Sometimes you'll see very outdated comprehensive plans so that makes the hazard mitigation plan an opportunity with the every five year cycle and also funding and support federally to think about how that then integrates with the comp plan and how we can use that as a tool to help make decisions. So getting into a little bit of the specifics there is that, that you know hazard knowledge is really a solid foundation for making our community stronger and guiding those decisions. 
So thinking about who's impacted, what assets are at risk, um, what's the cost and what are the community priorities? It's a really big opportunity to align those two planning efforts and think about those common goals and using the strengths from each planning efforts to, to come together to make um, some stronger decisions on how we're using our land and our space. Um, and an example of how these two can really mingle to come together is looking at, um, you know, in an overlay zone for the wildland urban interface, for example. So the, the hazard mitigation plan really is pulling some strong data to analyze the risk um, and know where that zone lies. And then the data that is the boundary of that zone risk can then be put into um, an overlay zone because your overlay zone has to show a nexus between where it's located or and, and um, and how you made decisions for the boundary. So you have to have a strong connection there um, in order for it to be legally sound. So using that data from your hazard mitigation plan allows you to then put your boundaries of your overlay district and regulate the land in a way that keeps people safer and reduces their risk, but you need both pieces. Um, so it's a key opportunity again for those two to work together. All right, and then throughout the planning process, there's already within the hazard mitigation plan process, um, key considerations for land baked in, in the review. So um, looking at, you know, have past land use activities reduced the impact or vulnerability from hazards? Um, does the community have enabling legislation of hazard proof land use tools? And, and so on and so forth, all the way through plan updates. So. This is already part of the process. It's just a matter of really pulling this out, doing a good job and making it meaningful for the community to connect this back to their other plans that we're gonna see um, a strong, strong return on the process and the investment in that process when it comes to implementation. All right, so I mentioned this brief run we chats. Um, the Office of Emergency Management and Land Use Planners, they really need to hang out more, in my opinion. They have common goals and mission, as I mentioned. However, they've got very different tools at their disposal and different expertise. They think about their communities in different mindsets, right? They have a different relationship to the community and they really talk about common topics in different ways. So in our next quiz, we have on the left side, go to the next slide. All right, in A, B, and C, we have an emergency manager talking about some key issues that they have. And in one, two, and three, we have land use planners talking about key issues that they have. So I'll read A and then let me know what number you think uh, best matches up to it for the land use planner. The emergency manager says, the homes on that hill are in the wild and urban interface. Um, they planted a lot of new trees and shrubs close to them. What can we do to correct this hazard? What would be the, the likely match there from a land use planner perspective in one, two, or three? Seeing a couple of threes in the chat. Some of yes. them went directly to me, so I'm announcing it out loud. <laughs> oh, good, because I was like, all right, we have one representative for the group of 164, which maybe this person was elected. All right, so homes on the hill that are in the WUI, um, thanks for submitting a complete permit for your landscaping plan. Everything looks to be in order. So a lot of times we'll see that landscaping um, requirements in a jurisdiction are focused on a beautiful community that matches the character, that encourages people to, to, to put lovely landscaping around their home. However, if that doesn't communicate with our hazard mitigation plan, then um, we have a, a problem where the two might conflict and we're now requiring investment in landscaping that is actually increasing the exposure to a hazard. Um, I wish we could convince, all right, so B, I wish we could convince the community not to build in the marshland that floods. What number would we pick here? I'm seeing a lot of responses for two. 
Um, good, so the conservation easement would be a great community asset for health and recreation. I wish we could find a way to fund it. So again, we have people that are wanting to build in this beautiful, beautiful space close to water, it might be marshy. And then we also have community planners who are thinking, man, this is a community recreation area we'd love to see pre preserved. Each of these two have opportunities with distinct funding sources. If they can come together for a conservation or taking land out of development that both retains beauty and um, a recreational resource and keeps people out of harm's way, it's easier to, to compile those funding source opportunities and reach a common goal. All right, and the last one, C. Hi, we're working on buyouts along the river and the floodplain. Can you help? And if we get this one wrong, we just know we weren't listening before because it's our only option left. Um, but the answer is, sorry, I'm busy trying to figure out what to do with these non-conforming structures by the river. So the terms in these, one is very emergency manager and one side is very planner, but they're talking about the same problem. Um, buyouts along the river in the floodplain is a key tool that we know we have to get people out of harm's way once they're already there. Non-conforming structures um, is a key problem that land use planners have that your structure is no longer allowed to be improved upon. Um, so the value of it diminishes greatly. There's not a lot of opportunity for you to sell it because the value diminishes and you're not allowed to improve it. And at the same time, it's probably that individual's biggest asset that they own. So again, trying to connect the dots here on how to help the homeowner, how the land use planner can connect back to them when they come in for a permit and it's denied um, and making sure that the two can work together. All right, well, thanks for making Funville safer um, and helping me think through some of our lingo that we have. Um, one of the last things I wanted to talk about is that these tools have been shown to be really effective. So it's pretty clear to people when you build a large piece of infrastructure, what it's gonna do, um, what that investment means. Land use tools are rather invisible and they can be sometimes a hard sell politically, but they have a huge return on investment when done in effective and thoughtful ways. Um, in 2013, um, Region 8 in, in Colorado, where I sit, we had a pretty large flood that impacted um, some of our foothill and mountain communities severely. And through the losses avoided study that they did, they were able to see that development restrictions um, saved uh, Larimer County communities $486 million by not having the impact. Um, freeboard restrictions saved $206 million and critical facility restrictions saved another 23 million. So these are not large communities that I'm talking about. Um, a lot of them are very rural and this level of um, loss avoided allowed them to bounce back more quickly, allowed their communities to um, continue to see growth and prosperity and ensure that the people and the investments were kept out of harm's way. There's also community rating system benefits um, realized through you know, increased regulations and building codes that are baked into our land use decisions. Um, but the last thing I'll note is that they're not pricey like many infrastructure projects are, but they do require legal support, technical expertise, political and public support, and then people to administer them when they're enacted. So, so not free, still need um, support and requirements, but a really strong return on our investment given that a lot of these could be enacted in a community for you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or less. Great, we'll turn it over to Shupa to talk about the national perspective from planning. Thanks, Chrissy and Anne. Um, thank you, FIMA colleagues for your time today. Um, to discuss this important topic. Can you hear me and see me? Just checking. Okay. Yes. Um, yep. Okay, great. Um, I can't see myself, sorry. So um, thank you, FIMA colleagues, for your time today. Um, the importance of land use planning and um, development codes. There are other codes, you know, not just the land use plan and building codes in local resilience decisions. Um, Anne has talked about the connection between land use planning and mitigation planning. Um, they are separate. Sometimes there's a confusion between, you know, land use planning and mitigation planning. They sound very, um, you know, similar. Um, and that was one of the points we wanted to um, get across through this webinar. 
Um, and now I want to talk to you about the mitigation planning, process, the national, you know, sort of perspective on where we've reached and what's the path forward. So um, next slide, please. So in the last um, approximately two decades um, since mitigation, disaster mitigation of act of 2000 was, was passed requiring, you know, these, these plans to be prepared. The reach of the program is wide. 83% um, of the country's population is covered. Um, by a mitigation plan. So all of the light blue that you see on the map are all the local jurisdictions that are, you know, that have an approved plan. Um, and all the, the states and the tribes uh, mentioned as of, you know, March 30th. The planning process is established and repeated every five years. These plans are formally adopted by the local state tribal government approved by FEMA and they're an elig eligibility requirement for HMA and mitigation project funding under PA. So every five-year update is an opportunity to expand and advance the work done so far. Um, uh, so far, the um, the compliance and having the plan um, is has been you know sort of important for that eligibility you know requirement. Um, but it's really you know every five-year update is an, is the opportunity to really advance it, start using the plans um, as a um, for uh, you know, making investment decisions involving the whole community. So um, every five years, um, the state or local or tribal community can take that plan and um, in that update, integrate the plan with these community planning um, and land use planning um, initiatives that are that may be going on at the um, and in their level. And maybe there are. Um, I saw in the chat that there was a CWPP mentioned the community wildfire protection plans integrate the mitigation plan with these other plans that are going on, coordinate, you know, talk to them, hang out, as Anne said, improve engagement with community-based organizations that represent underserved communities, accurately reflect changes in risk, and recalibrate the mitigation strategy and priorities. So the five-year updates are that established and repeated process that allow you to do that, um, that allow, you know, states and locals to do that. Um, next slide, please. So um, with this graphic, we really wanted to show that the planning process and the plan can be um, used to guide um, the community's journey to resilience. In their you know, mitigation program, um, all FIMA programs play a role in this journey to resilience. The HMA you know, planning grant may start that journey and the approved plan is a very important milestone because of the eligibility requirement but the community can really use the, the planning process to navigate um, this entire journey. So the lady is using the planning process as uh, you know her map um, with the community priorities in her backpack. And so um, the, the partners that are made during the planning process, we often you know um, really you know talk about get your key stakeholders in your mitigation planning process. So. Once they are on board and this conversation about resilience has been started with the mitigation planning process, um, then there's increased understanding of risk and the buy-in has been created for mitigation action. So then use that and come up um, with actions. Some of the actions may turn into HMA projects um, or other you know, projects or actions funded by um, other agencies. But some of them could be land use regulations. Some of them could be adopt and enforce building codes. So whatever that community decides um, as taking that planning process as the beginning of that journey um, and reaching that. So if you're familiar with the National Mitigation Investment Strategy, it emphasizes the coordination of all of the whole community, private, nonprofit, um, and you know, government agencies to maximize the impact of mitigation investments. So think of state and local and tribal mitigation planning as the investment strategy that that is developed you know at that level state tribal local to identify hazards understand risks and create that buy-in and actually you know take action for mitigation um, so i just wanted to do a quick word before we go over um, to um, the next slide and the next section presented um, by and then also wanted to pr pr present some of the uh, resources for this land use planning and mitigation planning connection. 
And the program has really prioritized um, plan integration and implementation so that the plans can be used to their full potential to increase resilience. It could be, like I was saying, you know, through projects or through land use planning regulations or building codes or, you know, all of the, uh, when the communities identify and analyze a, a comprehensive range of actions, they could, um, you know, choose and see what works for their community. So not every um, tool for mitigation is gonna work for that community. So next slide, I think is just resources and um, the planning for hazards website, Colorado's, um, the survey of state land use and natural hazard planning laws is work done by uh, American Planning Association using a FEMA um, you know, CTP grant. So we in mitigation planning work with the American Planning Association to get this information tools out to the community planning you know, world um, and this is one survey that actually shows the state enab enabling legislations um, that Anne mentioned a couple of times that it depends on that state and that, you know, locality, what is there in their, you know, planning legislation, what is the culture of planning, the history, the landscape of planning and whether they are talking about disaster resilience in those um, re legislations or mitigation requirements. So, some states have actually the survey is not just a survey, but it has actually recommendations on where they could build those. Maybe they could build some, you know, climate related um, regulations in that. So that's a very, you know, great resource. Um, and then integrating mitigation and land use planning resources. So we kept it not just overall um, planning resources, but more the ones that are talking about this nexus between mitigation planning and land use planning. Um, and mitigation planning can also be used um, to promote building codes. So that's the next part of our webinar today. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank you all for your time today. Next slide and turning it over to Amanda or Chrissy first, sorry. Nope, Amanda, welcome. Great, thank you. I, can you hear me and see me okay? Looking sound and great. Great, thank you. Um, well, I, first of all, just thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And both Anne and Shuba gave some great presentations. And my hope is that with uh, my following slides, I can help demonstrate that um, you know we can connect both mitigation planning and community planning, um, and that codes, uh, building codes, uh, should be a part of that conversation. So we'll, let's go ahead and jump into the next slide. So uh, this is, um, at first glance, um, very poor, poorly graphically done, and that's um, my excellent use of PowerPoint. Um, but uh, let's, let's pretend for just a moment that there is a tornado coming, and we have only moments, uh, you know, maybe, maybe two minutes, to take an action. We don't have time to evacuate, so we're going to uh, go seek shelter in one of these houses. Um, on the outside, the houses look exactly the same. Um, but let's say we go into the upper left house and let's go to the next slide. So once the tornado hits, um, if we chose the upper left house, we, we escaped the tornado and we survived and we're, we're feeling good. Um, if we had gone into the upper right house, perhaps this house wasn't built to modern code standards and maybe we didn't survive or maybe we're very injured. Uh, in the bottom right corner um, in this home, uh, this home you survived, but you are heavily reliant on insurance. And we know, uh, based on our natural hazard mitigation saves report, as well as our building codes uh, save study, uh, that building codes are really um, the best option for mitigation after land use has taken place. So um, that means, you know, first of all, we don't want to put uh, vulnerable communities, um, we don't want to put valuable infrastructure in places that are um, at risk to hazards. Um, and if they are, then we want to make sure that we are building to the best building codes to ensure resilience of the community um, so that everyone can escape um, without uh, a dependence 
on insurance or uh, without any damages. So let's go to the next slide to talk a little bit more about building codes. So the building code save study um, came out uh, last year and it shows that overall having an adopted hazard resistant building code can save you um, an 11 to one ratio. Um, so that, you know, that's really great. So we know that building codes work over the last 20 years, uh, modern building codes have saved us, us being FEMA response dollars, at least $32 billion. Um, however, you can see by the picture in the upper right there that uh, building codes are pretty spotty across the US. Um, so despite their benefit, uh, only 30% of communities have adopted modern hazard resistant building codes. Um, so I'm gonna spend the next few slides talking about why that is and some of the issues related to that um, and how we can uh, work through the community planning process to help uh, both increase resilience as well as help communities get to uh, those modern or um, higher performance building codes. So let's go to the next slide. So this slide um, is a high level description of the difference between land use and building codes. So zoning, um, like Anne talked about so eloquently, uh, zoning really tells us what you can build. So whether that is looking at densities, whether that's looking at specific structures that are allowed, um, but also defining areas for open space, defining areas for uh, specific uses and um, thinking about public health. Building codes are really much more about how do you safely build here? So building codes get much more into the weeds on specifics of roof connections and foundations and types of windows and pipe connections. So building codes are really specific to um, the structure itself. So um, let's go to the next slide. And I want to give you an example of uh, where land use and building codes kind of played out in the news. So um, on the far right, you can see the, um, the Oregon coast um, and all the little tiny polygons that you see are showing areas of tsunami inundation expected from the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. So the entire coast is vulnerable to tsunamis. And the state of Oregon used to have um, a land use restriction um, saying that no critical facilities could be built in the tsunami inundation area. Um, so that's because you want uh, first responders and hospitals to be functional after a tsunami so that they can support response to an event um, and so that you can reduce losses. We don't want um, our hospitals to be inundated. So um, in uh, just a, a few years ago, um, the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is the kind of guiding authority on building codes, um, came out with, a, with guidance on building in tsunami zones, um, looking at loading and effects. So very technical in the weeds, uh, structural performance of tsunamis. And they released guidance saying, if you're going to build in a tsunami hazard area, this is how you do it. And so the state of Oregon actually repealed um, their their law on uh, restricting development. So critical facilities were allowed to be built um, in the tsunami hazard area. So um, they're saying, well, okay, you can build here now, but there's a lot of people that are very upset about this um, and that why would we take this risk to begin with? So, you know, development pressures uh, can be quite high, um, but this is really a case study on um, the difference between land use restrictions and building codes. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so building codes, as we saw in the previous example, um, building codes, first of all, are not retroactive. So that means with the repeal of the tsunami inundation zones um, the, in Oregon, um, just because we can build for tsunamis now um, and those codes are adopted, it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't mean that all the current infrastructure that is there is now at that performance level. 
So building codes are also minimums. And um, this is a graphic on the slide about earthquakes. And um, it's just, I'm, it's, uh, I'm more comfortable with earthquakes. That's, that's it's kind of my jam. So um, that's why I'm using this example. Um, but building code, so when people say this is built to code, um, that's built to a life safety standard. So that means it's not regulated um, to immediate occupancy. It's not expected necessarily to be operational or functional after an earthquake. Um, and so this is the same with most building codes. Most building codes are for life safety standards. Um, so um, an example of where this played out further is in Christchurch in 2011, uh, there was a large earthquake. And um, while there were um, not uh, as many deaths as expected um, in, a, in a larger earthquake, what we saw was that um, the entire central business district of Christchurch, New Zealand was shut down because um, buildings that had collapsed um, that were pre-code um, made areas surrounding it dangerous. So they weren't safe to occupy because of these other buildings. And despite you know, for the lower um, death toll, there were huge economic losses as a result of the entire uh, central business district being shut down. So um, next slide, please. Diving into this little example a bit further, I'm trying to demonstrate that um, just because you have adopted a modern building code doesn't mean that all the infrastructure is, um, is at that code. So existing infrastructure is a real risk. And here um, is pulled from the National Risk Index, a slide showing earthquake exposure. So um, infrastructure and social exposure to earthquake hazards compared to both riverine and coastal exposures. So you can see earthquake is significantly higher in almost every location. And uh, this code here on the right, um, or sorry, this code here, um, this table three here that you see is um, was done by an engineer in Washington state looking at code adoption years at versus performance standards of structures. And we found that um, structures really built prior to that 1994 building code um, don't have the highest level of performance. So while we want to help communities to adopt modern building codes, we also want to help them update their existing infrastructure to the same standards of current codes, or at least consider options for even higher performance. So let's go to the next slide. So FEMA's Building Sciences um, has produced a number of uh, guidance on and um, recommendations on how to improve uh, building performance, um, what the recommended above code uh, standards should be for earthquakes. And um, through the National Mitigation Investment Strategy, uh, Region 8 recently developed a guide on how do you actually help communities develop programs to update their existing infrastructure. Um, and I just wanna point out as well, um, looking at that next, the next slide, that um, we often think, okay, well, let's just, you know, require building, let's require communities to um, have mandatory code upgrades or retrofits. And I just want to point out that this isn't necessarily equitable. So as Anne pointed out in her slides, you know, we've got marginalized communities um, that, um, you know, have income disparity. And we have found that many, uh, pre-code structures um, are culturally or historically valuable. So we can't just um, you know, demo the building and build a new, that we need to protect that structure for the value it serves beyond just the structure itself. Um, we also need to understand that by requiring mandatory retrofits that um, are not subsidized for the owner or the occupants of that building, that that may contribute to deferred maintenance leading to substandard living conditions. So there's an equity component in both mitigation planning, community planning, as well as in the implementation of building codes. So let's go to the next slide here. Um, I just gave you a lot of information. Um, and I wanna point out that you know, we know mitigation saves, um, but by building to minimum codes, um, we are 
creating a reliance on insurance. Okay, so we are focusing very much on uh, the the life safety. We're not. Uh, we're, we want to make sure our buildings don't uh, kill people, but we're not guaranteeing um, or we're not prioritizing um, functional performance of structures after an event. So let's go to the next slide, and I'll get into kind of why why we why we are in this current state. So um, again, on the far right, you can see the graphic of a code adoption in the US. And you can see that um, there's the white areas are areas that do not have current code data. The yellow is um, they have weakened codes and the green is the 2015 or 2018. So that's what we want them to be at currently. Um, communities um, are, uh, disadvantaged um, based on their state laws often. So how do we help them uh, get to a baseline of codes and how do we help them understand opportunities to improve their codes? And so the FEMA Building Codes Workgroup has developed um, and is in process currently of developing uh, the FEMA Building Code Strategy. And there are three primary goals to this. They want to integrate codes and standards across FEMA. So we wanna make sure that all FEMA programs understand what building code minimums are and help communities to adopt those codes. Um, we want, uh, the second goal is to strengthen nationwide capability for superior building performance. And I wanna point out those words, superior building performance. So this is, we wanna help communities get to that baseline code level, but we also wanna help them understand those opportunities to have higher standards for building performance. And then the third goal is driving public action on building codes themselves. So how do we help the community, um, the public, um, when I say that, um, how do we help the public become more educated consumers and help them to uh, get higher standards in their community? So let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna walk through a few examples of um, opportunities to, um, learn about what their code status is. So the first is the building code adoption tracker, and this is relatively new. Um, in FEMA world, we call it BCATS. Um, and then here's the link. It's, um, it doesn't really show up if you Google a building code adoption tracker, but if you type in or copy paste this URL, you can get there and you can find um, where the, uh, the codes are for your state. Um, so next slide, please, is uh, getting at the annual BCAT fact sheet that the FEMA Building Sciences produces, and this generally comes out in the first quarter of every year. And in the upper right, you can see the link to access these fact sheets, and there's actually one developed for each FEMA region as well. And so um, this will describe code adoption in your states, um, as well as um, uh, showing uh, information on dates adopted. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, the third, or I guess second resource that I wanna point you to is called inspecttoprotect.org. And this is a site that is publicly available and you can type in your, um, your address or zip code to find out how strong your building code is. So I did mine and I live on the Puget Sound and um, you can see uh, here it says that my codes are up to date. However, it asks you to put in the year that your structure was built. And my home was actually built in the 1920s. And so it doesn't quite go as far back, but when I put in earthquakes um, and the year built, it tells me that um, your residence um, may have been constructed to a previous code version and it will be stronger against extreme weather if you make certain home renovations, retrofits, or upgrades. And then it actually provides a series of mitigation actions that I can take for my home to make it stronger to earthquakes. So this is a really great tool. It also includes um, his, the historical code adoption as well. So there are resources out here for communities uh, to understand their building codes. And FEMA is taking a really serious stance on uh, trying to promote building codes because we know how much it can save us in disaster costs. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so I've talked a lot about the difference between code adoption and existing infrastructure. 
And um, many of you may have heard about bee segs and that um, I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, but if you look at the notice of funding opportunity for our BRIC grants this year, you'd see that there were two building code requirements um, in the technical evaluation rubric. Um, one is that they must have um, the adopted 2015 or 2018 uh, building codes. And the other is that they have to have a building code effectiveness grading schedule or BSEG score so of, um, of one to five. So let's go to the next slide. What is BSEGs? So BSEGs, building code effectiveness grading schedule, um, is uh, conducted by ISO, which is the Insurance Services Office. And they meet with communities um, every five years um, to review their building codes and opportunities for improvement. And they give them a score of one to 10, and this is found on the BSEGS questionnaire. So um, through, you can access um, the annual report. Um, so 2019's is available at isomitigation.com slash BSEGS. And it provides the latest information on code effectiveness and enforcement. So this is getting past just adoption and actually getting at adoption or uh, getting at effectiveness. So let's go to the next slide. So for FEMA to access uh, this report, you can go to that BSEGS um, website, isomitigation.com, um, but the completed questionnaires for at the community level are actually proprietary. So locals can provide them to you, um, but they're developed through the, um, they're stored at the local building officials office. Um, our PTS contractors can also um, request data um, for us and provide that to us. So reach out to your PTS if you're interested in a certain community. Um, but accessing this information through the local building official um, is an important step. And um, I want to go to the next slide and just show you um, some sample questions. This is an ugly slide, um, but these are all questions pulled from that questionnaire that is done between ISO and the community building official. So looking at, um, you know, do you, does your jurisdiction's general or comprehensive plan contain information or policies related to the construction of buildings or infrastructure within areas subject to natural hazards? So here we see building codes are talking to, uh, to the land use, to, the, to our comprehensive plans. And we just need to help communities understand these conversations and the implications of weaknesses found here. Um, so again, more questions get into funding and education uh, or even financial incentives related to building codes. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into this in more detail. I'm just, I'm using this slide to show you that there's some really in-depth questions here that can help inform our mitigation planning process at the local level, as well as our comprehensive planning process. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I, I'm trying to make this connection here between land use regulations and building codes and that they do talk to each other through our BSEGS questionnaires. So we should use those BSEGS questionnaires um, uh, more um, or pay attention to them a bit more closely to help inform mitigation strategies. So how do we do that? Let's go to the next slide. So um, I'm throwing so much information at you and um, I wanna help tie it all together. So um, this is a graphic um, with a few additions of my own um, showing the community planning framework. So um, as Anne showed us, there's the general plan or comprehensive plan. Many communities also have a strategic plan, um, but FEMA requires local communities to have local hazard mitigation plans. Um, as well as tribes and as well as states to access federal funding. All of these plans in this framework uh, contribute to community resilience and they also promote uh, social equity. So social equity should be embedded into the community process. And I wanna show my next few slides here are getting into how both uh, local hazard mitigation and building codes um, 
I, I'm showing how FEMA has this really unique opportunity to help support local community planning through mitigation plans and codes. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. So for starters, um, the community planning framework is really kind of guided through the American Planning Association. Um, it's kind of like the ASFPM for land use planners. So um, it's where all the planners get together, motivated by the desire to create better communities with clean environments, affordable housing, open space, accessible transportation, and hazards play a component um, to, to this. And uh, while we know that um, there has been systemically excluded groups, mitigation planning uh, can help advance um, and, and get over uh, some of these issues. So I've only got a few minutes left, but I wanna get into the hazard mitigation plan component here. So looking at the intent of hazard, oh, let's go to the next slide, I'm sorry. The intent of hazard mitigation plans is to identify what is vulnerable to natural hazards and to strategize what the community is actually going to do about it. What are they gonna to do to mitigate? So how do we go from the reliance on insurance and known expected damages to we escaped, uh, you know, we survived the disaster and we're, we're doing just fine. So let's go to the next slide, please. So plans, um, mitigation plans require three main things. One is an inclusive planning process, two is a risk assessment, and three is a mitigation strategy. These plans, like Shuba pointed out, are required to be updated every five years, just like the BSEGS questionnaires are updated every five years. There's also an annual state mitigation consultation meeting where FEMA meets with the state to talk about their mitigation program through the context of their mitigation plans. So we should incorporate uh, building codes into this conversation as well. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so I mentioned uh, the inclusive planning process. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so I wanna talk really quickly. Um, the Biden administration recently released the executive order on advancing racial equity for underserved communities. And the mitigation planning process, uh, based on its current requirements through CFR, already requires an inclusive planning process um, where uh, community members are in actively engaged in the plan. And the plan is actually required to identify how they were engaged, how they'll be engaged over the five-year planning cycle as well. Um, and then uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so part of that inclusive planning process is also involving relevant stakeholders. And there's an element in the plan that says that the plan should include the review and incorporation of existing plans, studies, reports, and technical information. So not only should this include building codes, but as uh, we pointed out earlier, this should also uh, address other hazards. So um, I think Jack mentioned the CWPP. Um, that's a relevant plan that should be analyzed through the context of hazard mitigation planning. Um, so in addition to engaging the public, jurisdictions need to be engaging each other and breaking down silos of their own programs. Um, so our emergency managers and code officials and community planners should all definitely hang out more to Anne's point. Um, there should definitely be more mingling between community planning and uh, emergency management, but also code officials. So I just have um, a few quick slides left. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and I want to talk about the risk assessment. So um, again, the risk assessment uh, is a required component of the hazard mitigation plan. And we can go to the next slide. And uh, those are the, the uh, risk assessment is defined by um, the uh, what hazards and what assets um, are where, where they, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at comments and getting distracted. Um, so where is that overlap between hazards and community assets? And so you can see here that community assets include both the population and the built environment. So let's go to the next slide. 
uh, the population should include an analysis of demographics, income disparity, and housing. Um, looking at local social programs as well. And on the bottom right, this is a list of 14 different um, categories that King County, Washington actually used in their hazard mitigation plan to assess the vulnerability of communities um, based on social equity. So looking at the vulnerable populations through the context of, well, what makes them vulnerable um, and how is that exacerbated by natural hazards? And this is, um, this can be and should be part of the hazard mitigation planning process. So let's go to the next slide and we'll look at uh, the built environment. And I just wanna point out that, um, you know, generally this is done with assessors data and a GIS overlay, um, but this should include building codes and performance levels as well. So looking at the next slide, um, all of these three things um, uh, are eligible under BRIC and HMGP. So under BRIC, they uh, fall under capability and capacity building activities. Um, so risk assessments, strengthening of mitigation strategies, plan integration, um, looking at building codes, these are all eligible activities under uh, BRIC and HMGP. So getting to the end here, we'll go to the next slide. Um, I want to point out that hazard mitigation plans do have regulatory teeth, so they are defined through CFR, the requirements are, um, and in order to receive public assistance, um, so 406 funding, you must have a FEMA, <clears throat> excuse me, approved hazard mitigation plan, and then um, some components um, of public assistance also require that. Um, additionally, um, to be eligible for BRIC funding, you have to have an approved hazard mitigation plan or be using BRIC funding uh, to get a plan. So um, these are all connected mitigation plans uh, connect, connect all of the things. So let's go to the next slide. And just to, just to summarize here, um, I'd like to advocate that building codes should be recognized in our state, local, tribal, and territorial mitigation plans that code improvements and code adoption are sound mitigation strategies. And both BRIC and HMGP can fund data and strategies in the hazard mitigation plans. So my last slide here is, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, my last slide here is just showing that FEMA has this really unique opportunity to talk to communities since we're the ones reviewing their plans. Um, and help them integrate both social equity as well as building codes into their community planning framework to help them achieve resilience. And uh, with that, I will toss it over to, um, I believe to Chrissy uh, for any yeah. questions that have popped up. Thank you. Okay, we have had a, a handful of questions. You can continue to um, send them. Um, we did have one question um, that was the biggest barrier to building code adoption. And John and Gargiola, I saw that you um, answered in the chat, but I would invite you to also speak your uh, answer out loud because I think it's a good one. Um, um, Chrissy, thank you very much. Um, something we've learned um, recently through some consumer awareness um, behavior studies and focus groups is just, um, that building codes are out of sight, out of mind from the average consumer. And it's not, it's not because they don't care about it. It's the perception that they don't have to care about it. They don't have to worry about it. It's already taken care of. And of course, their, um, their local officials and elective leaders um, you know, are, are, uh, are taking care of this for them. And there's no real reason to worry. So that was... <clears throat> That was um, a very important finding through this um, building code awareness um, study. And that has prompted the, the creation of a multi-partner building code awareness campaign. And um, um, Amanda showed the, the website, which I encourage a lot of people to go to, www.inspecttoprotect.org. Not only do you get the code information, but you get um, some of this, the findings of this research, you get some um, PSA spots. And really it's, it's um, you don't have to be an engineer, an architect or a planner to be in this business. It, um, the average uh, citizen, just with a little bit of information 
um, can you know be a powerful voice both, both for planning for codes once they understand uh, a little bit about what it means to them um, it's really we call it a call to action or you know being active or act you know becoming activist in this in this sense and I do believe that um, it it is um, linked to the equity considerations equity concerns where it's no fault for the citizen or the consumer if they if they're if they're born in, in a certain place or they're moving to a certain state is the first thing they're thinking about the building code no um, uh, but maybe the laws are such that they're not allowed to have a building code or or it's restricted in what codes that they can have. Um, but what do you think the reaction would be um, if a whole bunch of them started to show up at, at the community meetings, at um, public hearings? Again, this is ties back to the comments. You know, um, they elected these people to to you know have their back, if you, uh, as a, as it were. So I think that uh, that's something untapped. And in addition to all of those uh, diamonds that Amanda showed, you know, there's a house at the bottom. We have to talk to those people, and, and, and yeah. the citizens, so. Thank you, John. Sure. Um, our next question was, FEMA and its programs have started to integrate the idea of community lifelines. Can the panelists speak to how land use, building codes, and planning relate to community lifelines and or critical facility protection? Uh, this is John, I can start. Um, and uh, one of the ways, and I'll put this in the link, is that as Amanda has been speaking, uh, FEMA programs and, and, and the federal assistance are aligning with these, uh, these latest consensus codes and standards. And, and really, um, um, when you look at that, um, it, it helps to define uh, what we mean by critical facilities. Um, and uh, also you find out some things that you wouldn't think of. Like we heard earlier, it's like, well, once those land use decisions are made, then go ahead and build in there. But we actually find some, some different things. So for example, the, um, the International Codes, the International Building Code incorporates by reference the um, American Society of Civil Engineers Flood Design and Construction Standard. And um, that standard, um, um, its requirements don't apply uniformly uh, to residential or non-residential, right? We're familiar with those ter terms, but every type of building is uh, categorized by its use and occupancy or its relative importance, and it's given a design class. So in ASE 24, um, there's a, a flood design class three, and there's that's for buildings and structures with a high risk to the public or significant disruption to the community. These could include schools, jails, nursing homes, uh, buildings and structures associated with power generating stations, water and sewage treatment plants, telecom facilities and the like. And then one level um, uh, above that, more of the um, uh, more, much more critical and essential is flood design class four. And that's, that's for essential facilities and services such as hospitals, fire rescue, ambulance, police stations, emergency shelters, um, emergency operations, power generated stations, public utility facilities, uh, communication towers, electrical substations, fuel water tanks, storage tanks, and so on and so forth. So um, for those design classes, there are, there are more restrictions in the design, in the loading. And I would argue, I would argue too, also where they're placed. So um, when communities adopt the International Building Code with the ASC 24, um, there are additional land use restrictions, um, I would argue, because there is a chapter on high risk flood hazard areas that goes above and beyond just the, the, the typical uh, special flood hazard area. So if there's the presence of alluvial fans or flash floods or mudslides or erosion prone or, or um, in ice jam and debris, um, it's not how to build in those areas. The standard outright says you cannot, you cannot build in those areas. So you do see yeah. um, some, some um, land use zoning type uh, language uh, integrated um, so, uh, sometimes in these consensus standards. And I think that helps the planning process. 
Thank you. Well, we are at time today. If any of our panelists um, want to stick around, you are welcome to, but I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so, so much for joining our conversation and a big thank you to our speakers for taking the time to prep and share their knowledge on land use and building codes. Um, today's presentation will be posted to the RMD SharePoint site. Um, we're hoping within the next week, if you are a person that does not have access to that site, We'll work with Vince Brown um, and our communications counterparts to figure out the best way to disseminate both the slide deck and the recording to all of you. Um, we hope that you took away a new perspective on how to reduce risk using land use and building codes and the connection to where and how we build. Thank you all so, so much for coming and you are free to drop. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It was very interesting. Yeah, I knew you were going to be on it. <laughs> <laughs> all those, all the building classes and everything you take. I'm still taking one right now, Bill. <laughs> you are. Uh, oh yeah. I got I my final leave. in final in two in two weeks, so get through oh, it. Really? Oh god. Hey, I had to leave your, uh... like. In,